So, uh, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of what's happened in type so far <laughs> over the last several hundred years <laughs> and what may happen next. And I have to do this in 30 minutes or less, so it's a lot of history in a short amount of time. So I'm just going to cover the things I think are most interesting for web type and maybe uh, a little bit of prediction about what might be coming next. Um, but before I make uh, these pronouncements and prognostications, I think it's fair that you know where they're coming from. So who am I? Well, I'm not a designer. We actually have some great designers on the program, people who create stuff for screens of all sorts, people who can tell you more about using fonts. Uh, but that's not me. I'm not a typeface designer. Uh, we've got type designers on the program as well who can offer their unique perspective. And I'm not an engineer. Uh, we've got at least three guys here who know far more about the technology surrounding fonts. And I'm not a scientist. I may have a lot of ideas about what makes typefaces legible, uh, but I'm certainly not a professor of cognitive psychology or uh, neuroscience, and we actually have those people in the room as well. I'm none of these things. I'm a consultant, which is quite a boring term, not very, not very exciting. It usually conjures these kinds of images. These people are, he's consulting. He has, he has a paper there with nothing on it, and he's helping, helping this fellow out. Uh, it's hard to imagine a more generic title than this. Um, and sometimes I think I might be better to call myself a font broker, uh, which is much like a stock broker who helps buyers find stocks. I try to help font users choose and use fonts. But maybe anything related to Wall Street at this point in time isn't such a positive term either, uh, given what we think of Wall Street these days. And usually people think of a broker as somebody like this. So maybe you guys can help me think of a better title for myself, but actually this is kind of what I do. I've got type designers in one year and I have type users in the other year, and I'm trying to connect these people together because often they operate in separate circles, and fortunately now there is more interaction between them, but uh, I think it's important to help bring these two groups together. And so one of the ways that we do this is through Typographica, which is where we review typefaces and books. And the meat of the site is our annual review of new font releases. I ask some people in the industry whose opinion I admire to select their favorite release of the year and why it interests them. And it's not really a competition where there are entries that are formally submitted to a jury. I think that's a, a separate and, and valid concept. But instead, this is more of a broad overview of what happened in type each year. And I think that that's become increasingly important because there are literally thousands of new typefaces released every year. And I'll talk a little bit of why, about why there are so many in a moment, but I think it's important to have these kinds of uh, overviews and, and critiques and uh, kind of giving a context of, of what new important type is out there. And the other way that I help the type users and the type makers interact is with fonts in use. Uh, most of us see typefaces um, only in the way that they're presented by manufacturers of the fonts. If, if we know, you know, if we're looking at something new, it's usually presented by the people who make the fonts and, and specimens. Um, and maybe those faces that you do know well, you can spot them in the wild, but otherwise typefaces are usually uncredited as part of a design. And even though they're such a critical element of design, they're not really, they're given short shrift, as you could say. And Fonts in Use offers the opportunity to, uh, to see type in the wild. Uh, you know, even things that I might not think are beautiful, but they're high profile uses. It kind of helps you see what's popular, see what's being uh, used in mainstream design, see what's being used in more uh, experimental design. And it offers also an opportunity for, if you know a typeface and you think you know what it can do, you can actually see how it's been used in ways that you may not have imagined. Uh, and we have over 4,000 entries in the collection now, and you can submit your own stuff or stuff that you admire to the collection. 
uh, and many of them have analysis from our staff who uh, write blog posts about the uh, uses that they think are most interesting. And this is one of our more popular entries last year about the disaster of the Yahoo logo. Nobody likes it. <laughs> Here's Andrus talking about uh, grocery store. And the advantage for web typography is that, so, so the, in this example, you can see that if you, let me go back through there. On the side here of, e, of every entry, you have uh, a list of the typefaces used. So if you went and clicked on FFTSA here, you would then see a range of all the ways that TSA has been used that have been added to the site. But you can also explore through media, uh, industry, through platform or format. And so you could go and see just filter it by web uses and see how type is being used on the web. Uh, and it's given me some new insight into trends. I thought I understood what, what trends are happening in, in typography, but uh, you know, through getting submissions from other people and starting to organize these things and, and index them and categorize them in these ways, it started to help me see what's going on in, in typography in a way I didn't before. And the other site that informs how I experience the type world is, is Type Drawers. It's a typography forum with an emphasis on, on type design. And this is where font makers and some users uh, come together to chat about technical issues or politics. Yes, there are font politics. Uh, or marketing strategies or to critique each other's work. So these projects are the lenses by which I shape my view of typography. And uh, this is what I'm seeing right now, starting with some of the clearest changes over the last several years. And the first is that fonts are made with an, a, a, an increasing rate every year. And part of that is because the barrier to font production is lower. Qualifications and tools for making fonts are much easier to acquire than they were before. Uh, and you might think that would lead to masses of poorly made fonts, and it does. There is a lot of crap out there. Uh, but it also um, means that the number of skilled type designers is also growing. And um, so that it, it, it's, it's kind of coming from both ends of the spectrum as far as quality. So what kinds of things initiated these changes? Well, this is what type founding was like in 1909. Um, this is the <coughs> Linotype factory in Brooklyn. They were also making other things here, like Linotype machines. So that huge building wasn't just about making fonts. But uh, it kind of gives you an idea of the scale that was involved. It says here, 12 acres of floor space to uh, 2,500 employees. And this is type founding in 2014. It's just a guy and his laptop. I'm cheating a little bit here because this is actually not uh, Jean-Baptiste's uh, office. This was when he was visiting Indra. Uh, but it's probably not so different from what most foundries are today. They're usually one to three people, uh, a, a small uh, shop. And on these laptops are tools that dramatically increase the productivity of, of font makers. And uh, they're something that was much, it's much more accessible than the way that fonts were made before. And like I said, these designers are not only amateurs. Many of them have degrees in type design. Uh, and that was in the, certainly not the case even 12 years ago, 15 years ago. About 15 years ago, this is what the map looked like in terms of where you could get a postgraduate type design degree. Uh, there were some type design courses taught uh, by professionals at a few schools, but no dedicated type design program to speak of. Uh, by the year 2000, we had two prominent postgraduate programs in the Reading and at KBK in uh, The Hague. And now we have a type design certificate program in the US at Type at Cooper in New York. And then just two years after that, there were at least 11 institutions that offer some kind of specialized degree in type design. I mean, that's a huge shift from 2000 or even 2010. Uh, there's uh, Leipzig, there's uh, uh, Planton in Belgium, there's two in France, two in Switzerland, one in Mexico, and one in Argentina. And I'm probably missing some. You guys feel free to sh shout out if you know of others. But Czech Republic, well, thank you, Veronica. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to see, I'm going to have to update this map. <laughs> so, thanks in part to the 
schools and the availability of tools and the growth of production all around the world, the growth of type and the availability of new fonts is, uh, is staggering in the last five years. And the other big change that's happened since the advent of the web is that trends spread faster. And by trends, I mean both the ways that fonts are used and the style of typefaces themselves. And if we were to compare this to something historically, we could look at uh, Helvetica as a, a point of comparison. Uh, it was released in the late 50s, but it wasn't until 15 to 20 years later that it saw wide global mainstream use. Despite its association with 1960s modernism, it was really, in many ways, a typeface of the 70s and the 80s. And it's making a comeback again today, but that's another story. So back then, it could take a decade or two for something to catch on. And today, it takes mere weeks. Uh, if you look at this, you might know what trend I'm referring to, just looking at this image, but I'll give you some more hints. I can't verify all the details of the timeline of this trend, but the story goes something like this. Uh, a few months after Apple introduced iOS 7, uh, in what many people called a flat visual style, web designers quickly followed suit. Um, but a lot of these designers couldn't keep things exactly flat. They, they had to add something to it. And so many began to add this very long, exaggerated shadow. I don't know how well you can see it in, in, on this projection, but they would add these, these shadows to the type. And within weeks, it was a very visible trend, uh, especially on um, social networks like Dribbble. All of these that I'm showing here were designed within a three-month period. And of course, there are many, many more, uh, demonstrating the ability of social networks to facilitate not just the spread of kitten videos, but also design trends, too. And some of these actually make no sense to me. You're, they're obviously just following, following a trend. I mean, can a, a flip clock have raised numbers like this? I don't, I don't know. And then this one is quite postmodern. It's like embedded into, it's like debossed into the paper, but then it's also casting a shadow. And then there's other type on top of that. It's very, very experimental. And you know something's a legitimate fad once a generator is created, right? And then, of course, there becomes the inevitable backlash of overuse of a certain trend. Uh, so there are obvious trends in font usage, but also in the design of type itself. Uh, type designers do respond to what is popular, something that appears on a bestseller list or is prominent in design uh, in the in the design world can be replicated in new fonts within months or weeks. And here's a very real type design trend. P perhaps it's related to the, the long shadow, which is chromatic fonts, these layerable fonts that you can stack styles on top of each other to create shading effects, uh, color. Um, all of these that I'm showing here were released within the last two years, two to three years. And some are better than others. And while this might not seem like a web-based trend, Guess what? These are all available for web use. These are all web fonts. And I've seen many of them used online. So if these two facts are true, if you've got a much quicker font production and a much quicker spread of trends, then I want to imagine this possibility. That this is the future. This is the prediction that I promised you. Uh, people who use type may start to determine what kind of type comes later. That means you people who actually use fonts. Uh, the web font choices that you make now are not only going to affect your work and the web design of those around you, but also the typefaces that are produced tomorrow. And so that means the future is really in your hands, whether you like it or not. So I want to take the next kind of section of this to talk about making wise choices. Because if you have the future in your hands, it's now your responsibility to choose wisely. And in my experience as a marketing guy at Font Shop for a while, and now as the publisher of the websites that I mentioned, there are two uh, criteria that most people think about when they are choosing a new typeface. Obviously, number one is how it looks. They're looking for a specific kind of design. And the second is how much does it cost? But what most people don't think about, which is just as important, are these two criteria. 
how it looks in real life and how it's served. So with a web font, how is it actually getting from your design to the user? So what do I mean by real life? Uh, most fonts are shown by the, the, the font maker, like I talked before, uh, or the font retailer. And they're shown in settings that are either optimal for the typeface or some sort of default setting. And they're usually at a large size. Uh, and these are very limited scenarios. Uh, and then they rarely represent exactly how a font's going to be seen in real world use. Uh, in the real world, they're put through all sorts of abuse. They've, they're set in different colors, they're on different backgrounds, they're at different sizes, uh, and most importantly, they're going to be seen on different screens. And determining whether a font works in real life requires testing it against common points of failure. And what are those common points of failure? Of course, it depends on the use case. And it could be these or other, other uh, failure points. But for the most part, this is where I see the most problems. Windows performance, uh, by, by that I mean how well does it render in Windows and how well does it match the original uh, intention of the typeface design. Um, because as many of you know, Windows has a different kind of rendering engine than uh, Mac OS has, uh, it's going to try to force the typeface into the pixel grid in, in more of a way than the Mac will. And that rendering engine has gotten much better uh, than it was two to three years ago. Uh, but if you're designing a website on a Mac, then the type that your Windows visitors see, uh, no matter how new their system is, uh, is still not going to be the same thing that you see. And most of you probably understand this, uh, that Windows is affected by the quality of the hinting in the font and by the de design of the typeface itself, because some, some typeface designs are, are just not going to translate as well as others uh, into the Windows rendering engine. So how are, you, how are you going to get a good idea of how good the Windows performance is? Um, well, there are two, two good ways to do this. One is through browser emulation, where you go to a site like these two, and if you've already started working on a design, you can test it on a bunch of different kinds of browsers. Uh, but the disadvantage of that is that you don't have, uh, if, you, if you're just trying to make font choices, you may not necessarily have something to test against. Like you could try to throw in um, a Foundry's website and see how the fonts render uh, if you throw it through one of these sites, but that usually doesn't work. Um, and so a better, a better way to test uh, the, the Windows performance is if it's already provided by the foundry or the retailer. Uh, and I call these guys out because they do it well. Typekit and, and commercial type and okay type, they, they actually are showing you what you're going to get on all of these browsers. And I think that every provider of web fonts should be doing this. Um, and I think commercial type does it the best way possible because it allows you to actually compare them. So you're not going to see just one screen at a time. You can't, you're not going to see just Windows 7 and Firefox and then go to another page and see what the Mac OS rendering is like. You can choose three different, you know, maybe the most common browsers that you think are going to be used on your site and, and see, you know, how well does this typeface actually carry through to all the different uh, platforms and browsers. This is not a very good preview on a projection. But if you look at this on your screen, you're going to see the differences in rendering that happen. And so we want to encourage more uh, retailers and foundries to, to do this. I mean, it's, it's been maybe uh, four years now since uh, a lot of people started offering web fonts. And, and we're still not seeing enough of this, I don't think. Um, and some, like my fonts, have uh, started out with some previews, but then they pulled them away. And so I want you to all give them a hard time about that. We have anybody from my phone? Oh, Florian's here. Give him a hard time, Florian. <laughs> uh, so the other thing, the other failure point is text performance. Uh, again, when people are looking for new fonts, they're not necessarily looking at, at them at text size. They're looking at nice big previews, looking at the details of the typeface. And you, know, you can't blame someone for doing that. Uh, that's the best way to examine details, after all. But 
then when they take the font home, they've purchased it or they've licensed it or they've subscribed to a subscription and they, they start using it, then they're often in for a rude awakening. Uh, you simply can't use every typeface at every size. And most of it fails for small text or long text, for text and paragraphs. And I'm sure the others here later on today are going to talk about what makes a good text face or what makes something more readable or legible. But these are just some aspects to keep in mind. And the only real way to test text performance is actually see the web fonts rendered live at text sizes in a long passage of text. And this is why web font providers need to offer live previews of the web fonts, and many do, uh, but allow it to be resized and allow you to customize the text. And so we want to encourage better foundry and retailer web font samplers. Another good place to test the text performance is Typecast. Uh, that's a site where you can uh, go in and do some sample settings using uh, fonts from multiple providers and actually get a sense of how it performs at different sizes and with different settings. And then another good way to test this is with uh, browser tools that allow you to go to a website and then change, swap out the, the web fonts. So there are a couple of good ones. FontShop's web fonter is quite advanced. It, it allows you to take this little palette, apply it over the top of any website that you're on, and then apply web fonts to any one of the tags in the site. Uh, and it's really going to, if you've already designed a website of your own, it's going to give you a sense of how other fonts might perform on that site. Or if you're used to reading a certain website and you know the feeling of it, you know you, you either like it or you dislike it, but you have some familiarity with a website, this is a really great way to test how other web fonts are going to change that look or going to change that environment. And also WebType has a, a font swapper as well. So then our second, our second piece of criteria that we should pay attention to. There are three, this is really fun, this is license, licensing models, it's not so exciting. But it is important uh, because you can get web fonts in a lot of different ways. Uh, and these are the three main licensing models that we see. Um, and they can make a huge impact on cost, on performance, on what web fonts are available under each model. Uh, first, library subscription. I think most people are familiar with this because uh, that's Typekit's model, and Typekit was one of the first products out there. Um, and this is where you subscribe to have access to a larger library. So with Typekit, you have three different levels. Uh, so some, there, there may be more fonts available in a, in a more expensive uh, subscription. But you're paying to have access to a library of fonts rather than individual fonts. Fonts.com is another example. Uh, then there's subscriptions to individual fonts. And that's where you would go, you know exactly what kind of font or what font family that you want to license. And you're going to pay annually for the use of that font. And it's going to come through a service rather than be downloaded. You're going to still use a service, but it's not part of a library subscription. You're just subscribing to one font. Um, and Heffler is actually more of a kind of a hybrid model because you, 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 you already have a subscription to his service, and then you, you buy individual fonts through that. Uh, but this method is actually preferred by a lot of uh, type designers because it, it's going to be more equitable for them because they're going to be getting an individual license for the fonts that they develop rather than being part of a huge bundle like a more Spotify type model. And then they're self-hosted. So these are downloadable files. You go to a website and download them just like a print font, a uh, desktop font. Uh, and a lot of, so these retailers are, are offer them this way. And then a lot of small foundries offer this kind of service uh, because it's going to be simple for them. They're not hosting a service. They're uh, just producing web fonts, allowing you to download them and then host them on your own server. So I think that uh, there are, these three models make sense for different kinds of designers. And uh, going back to what I was said about users deciding what gets made, 
if you have a favorite one of these models, then it makes sense for you to use that and to encourage whoever is making fonts that you like to go for that model. Because the people who use these models are going to encourage type designers and retailers to offer those kinds of services. And you should also encourage people to offer more than one, if that's what you want. What we see next in new type design and new web font offerings is not just decided by the people who make the fonts, uh, but the people who use them. And that's why I keep drumming this in there, is that it, you want to start a dialogue with the people who are making fonts. You don't have to just rely on them to decide what they want to do. Start talking to them. Start uh, using their products and actually engaging with them in dialogue. People. It, it, you may be surprised, but people who make fonts actually like to talk to the people who use their fonts. They're actual humans. <laughs> and like I said, you should demand fonts. You should demand what works well. You should demand uh, fonts that render well on, on all systems. You should demand that web font providers provide Windows browser previews, as I showed you. Um, you should demand custom uh, live text previews that you can actually test the typeface's ability to set text. Uh, but also with demanding, you should get to know type designers. You should follow them and learn from them and talk to them. And most people who make fonts are not really wanting to be in their own silo. Some of them are that way. But some of them really do want to have this kind of uh, engagement and dialogue with the people who are, make, are using their stuff. You should ask them questions. You should just cha suggest changes. You should request customizations. I've had many experiences where, with my own website, I licensed a font or I'm using a font that I think is perfect for the site, but the, the spacing is just a little too tight for text for me. And going directly to the font maker and saying, is this something that you can modify? Can you make this a little bit looser? Uh, that actually is much more possible than most people realize. You should talk to them directly. And then you should support type designers by going directly to them when possible to license type. Because when it comes down to it, fonts uh, come from humans, not companies. They're made by humans. And that's never been more true than it is today. That's it. Thank you.